Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? All right. It's, uh, I can hear some ringing. If we can, uh, everybody start coming in and finding your seat. This is going to be the uh, 10 o'clock hour Sunday school. So uh, if you've never been here before, this is our Sunday school hour. Um, we're going to take uh, start by taking some prayer requests. So uh, all right, you have uh, Ruth.
We're starting a new series. Um, today we're going to be studying uh, Faith and Finances pa- uh, by Tim Rosen. So Pastor Wilson has given uh, Kim, Kevin Taylor, Tim Miller, and myself uh, this Faith and Finances, and we're going to probably spend maybe the next eight weeks or so. Don't know exactly just whenever the, the basically the book runs out, we'll do chapters and so it's, it's just a series. So we'll be going chapter by chapter, studying that in God's word. So if you've, you've heard it said, money makes the world go round. In truth, the money is woven in every part of our life. As long as we live, we'll be dealing with money. How to get it, how to spend it, how to save it, and how to give it. The world bombards us with conflicting messages regarding money. And almost all of these messages are contradicting to God's word. The the world system promotes loving and trusting money while offering no real solution for money-related worry or stress. Christians are certainly not immune to the war of money. Why do we as Christians struggle with money? God has given us freedom to choose And all too often we choose the world's philosophy over money rather than God's commandments. If you Google search how to manage money, you'll get millions of results. It would take lifetime to read them all, yet most of them are filled with advice that contradicts God's directives for our money. If we want the same results the world has experienced, then we can simply follow the world's advice. We can just go to Google and uh, just take that advice. If, however, we desire the benefits from God that, that has, God has planned for us, we must turn to his wisdom and follow his guidance. My oh, mouth's getting dry. Sorry. If you haven't been here before, I, I had cancer like 12 years ago, so um, my mouth gets really dry just from having chemo. And that's water. If it's uh, semi-relaxed, it's because uh, God's in control. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Proverbs 16, 25, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When we take an honest look at the ways and compare them to God's way, we see they are very different. When we follow God's way, we can experience peace of the promises God has for us. We need to weigh the scriptural foundation concerning God's view on money. The best way to achieve lasting results is to learn and embrace biblical truth and then draw practical applications from that. So let's see what God has to say about money. Many Christians assume that money matters of about budgets, spreadsheets, incomes, and expenses. They think it's strictly terms of material or emotional benefits. Scripture teaches us that money is, first and foremost, the matter of the heart. There are over 2,000 verses that address money. 16 of 38 parables deal with money, that Christ deal with money and possessions. Why is much of the Bible dedicated to this subject? God knows how challenging it is for us to rightly deal with money. So he gave us wisdom to help avoid the tragedy and achieve success. If you would, turn to Matthew 16, Matthew 19, and we're going to read uh, Matthew 19, verses 16 through 26. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16, 26, 16 through 26. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Everything good comes from God. 
But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which, Jesus said, thou shalt not, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father, father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said unto his di disciples, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that a, rich man shall, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of an needle than for the rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, When with men that is impossible, with God all things are possible. So we see in that story that God is telling him, Hey, do you know you want to get to heaven? Follow all my commandments. And the guy turns back and says, Oh, I already did that. You know, and then Jesus says, Jesus knows, you know, when we think about it, we can lie to our wives, we can lie to our family, and we can lie to our friends, but the Lord knows our heart. You know, a lot of times we can we think that. So why did Christ command this? Why not simply just trust in the Savior? Jesus knew the young man's heart, specifically what was on the throne of his heart. Christ's command exposed the simple love of money and possessions, the man's heart. But rather than repent and place his trust in Christ, the rich young ruler left sorrowfully. He would not part with his riches. They had the grip on his heart. Now if you'll turn to... Luke 19.1. Luke 19.1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was a rich and he was rich and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was of little stature was little of stature and he ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way and when Jesus came to the place he looked up and saw him and said unto him Zacchaeus Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when, and you see it says received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with the man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold and Jesus said unto him this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham for the son of man come to seek and to save which is lost so we see there that he had the love of Jesus we see that Zacchaeus was a publican a tax collector for the Romans the Roman system allowed his collectors to keep everything they received over a set quota. So publicans wrung every possible penny out of the people. Sounds like California. Understandably, they were despised among the common. Yet, despite the greedy, compassionless ways, Zacchaeus was still a soul that God loved. And Jesus called him out of the tree. When Zacchaeus met Jesus face to face, the words out of his mouth were, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. So he didn't have the same heart 
as the other man. The other man was already saying, like, hey, you know, I can, you can get to heaven. Well, Jesus died on the cross for us because we couldn't. Does anybody in here want to raise their hand and say they've obeyed all the Ten Commandments? Yeah, see? He was lying to Jesus, but this man basically said, you know, he was going to get, he gave half to the poor. He, he knew that his heart was not being greedy. So um, notice the contrast. Jesus did not instruct the rich man to sell all he had to give to the poor. As he told the, old, the other rich man, what was the difference? The Chaius voluntarily offered the outward expression of the inward change in his heart. He no longer loved wealth. He loved the Savior. While we should be following the example of Zacchaeus, many Christians are living more like the rich young ruler we love, wealth, rather than the Savior. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 9, Paul warned Timothy and us, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The phrase, the love of money, indicates reality that money is too easily given in a place and not just our wallets and budgets, but in our hearts. One of the meanings of the word err is to be, is the seduced. Isn't that pretty appropriate? for the term to describe the alluring of money. If we were to have peace, joy, and sound mind in relation to our finances, we need to align our hearts with God's word. We cannot cling to God's promises while excluding from our practices principles related to money. Our faith and finances cannot be divorced. Can we trust God's word to teach, instruct, correct, and comfort, and guide us in this very important and often personal area of money. Let's see how we can do that. We must never forget we are in a spiritual war. We have an enemy who attacks on many fronts. One of the fierce, fiercest spiritual battles for a Christian is the area of finances and possessions. The enemy attacks us, not necessarily blatantly obvious like tempting us to rob a bank, usually Satan tempts most Christians subtly. Perhaps it's an argument with our spouse over spending, the feeling of jealousy because a friend bought a newer, fancier car than ours, or the lack of gratitude uh, for which God has already blessed us with. I was listening to a message the other day on the radio, and uh, the lady and her husband, she was talking about her husband always left a coffee cup laying around instead of putting it in the sink, and it would just irritate her. And she said she felt that God laid on her heart, instead of taking it as a negative, she would to make it a positive. So every time she would see his coffee cup laying around, she would stop and pray for him. Rather than getting irritated, she would just pray. Then she expanded every time she would see a coffee cup. She said now she, she sees a coffee cup, and it makes her smile. And she sees constant prayer for her husband, and he just continues to receive blessings. The principle can be used for anything. So when I heard this, I told Trish, I said, all of us have different things, whether it's coffee cup, whatever it is. So ours is, uh, I won't tell you whose is which gets laying around, but <laughs> socks and sweet and low packets. <laughs> so I told Trisha, she'll be getting many blessings. So... If the devil can, fo can get us to focus on worrying about money for loving an abundance of wealth, he succeeds in getting us to take our eyes off the Lord. His ultimate goal is to harm the name of Jesus. In Hosea 13.6, we see, we read, the children of Israel were filled and the heart was exalted. Therefore, they have forgotten me. Satan wants to render your life ineffective for Christ. The one way he attacks is through your money. He wants us to believe a lie that you owe it all, you own it all, and that you are in charge. He wants your money 
to conquer you. This is directly opposite of what God's word teaches us. Notice the three principles that gives us, notice these three principles that gives us freedom from the hold of money it can have on our hearts. Number one, if you're taking notes, is God is the ultimate owner of all things. In Psalm 24, 1, the Psalm of David, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God owns the earth by right of creation. He made everything and belongs, that belongs to him. We can see his hand in creation everywhere we look. We can see the miracles of his, of his creation daily when rising and setting of the sun. And our hearts beat without a conscious effort and our ability to fight off germs and viruses that attack. Not only is God the creator, but he's also the caretaker. God takes care, takes very good care of all of us. That is his. He takes care of the world. God set the earth spinning at 1,040 miles per hour, a perfect speed. If we were spinning any faster, the centrifugal force will send us flying into space. He placed the earth at 92,960,000 miles from the sun. If we were any closer, we would burn up. If we were any farther away, we would freeze. God takes care of nature. My wife and Trisha, my wife, Trisha, not my wife and Trisha. Just put a little extra word in there. But tr my wife, Trisha, she's out at the uh, Welcome Center. So, uh, and I like to sit outside. It's like uh, in the backyard we have hummingbirds and uh, hummingbird feeders and everything. And I think of the birds, and then we have three dogs and a 120-pound tortoise. So uh, we sit out there constantly, and we just uh, look at just when something lands, butterflies, whatever it is, just the amazing thing, the ability that God, just his creation. It's just amazing just to see everything he does. It says uh, in, a, in a recent estimate, there are over 10,500 species of birds with new species being discovered every year. Why so many? God displays his awesome power of creation and cares for his creation. He takes birds, every member of the 10,500 species. Jesus made a connection between God and taking care of creation for his care for us. If we, uh, Matthew 6.26, if we turn to that. Matthew 6, 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor they gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which are of which of you, by taking thought, can, be, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If God cares for the world, he made everything in it. He will surely care for us as well. He is more than able and willing to take care of you and meet all your needs. Let's continue to look at the three principles that gives us freedom to hold, of, hold of money on our hearts. Number one was God is the ultimate owner of all things. Number two is we belong to God. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify your, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6.20 God owns the earth by right of creation, but we are doubtably by God. Not only did he create us, but we al he also redeemed us. If you've trusted as Christ as your Savior, you belong to God, purchased by the blood of Christ. I know when I got saved, I had listened to three messages, and my heart was pounding and pounding before I got saved. 
I didn't walk an aisle. I, I went home and I opened up the Bible. And if you're not saved, then let today be the day you ask God for, for forgiveness. It can be really intimidating when you're not saved. You think like when the pastor says and, you know, you'll have plenty of opportunities. You know, you might, somebody might knock on your door. Somebody might witness to you. You might have pastors stay up here and say, hey, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand. And you think in your heart, like, hey, I've been going to this church for 10 years. If I raise my hand, everybody's going to be like, what, are you crazy? How can you not be saved? But you're not. It's nothing. Everybody here will be rejoicing. They won't be pointing their finger at you. They'll be rejoicing with you. Everyone in here that is saved has done it. They've either walked an aisle or somebody showed them in the Bible how they can be saved. The angels will rejoice in heaven. So if you're not saved today, I ask just settle it today. Nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. The fact that God doubtly owns, doubtly owns us should be a relief to us. That means he will provide for us. It means he will care of the provision means the care of his provision and much like the father provides for his children yet satan ever seeking to turn our trust from god whispers in our ears that if we acknowledge that god owns everything our jobs our resources our homes our families even our lives he may take those that take those things from us and once he has convinced convinced us that we must protect ourselves from God, he then see, thinks to consume our minds with the worry of being our own provider. God's way is far simpler. When we acknowledge that our loving Heavenly Father owns and provides for us, we are freed from the cares of worry for tomorrow, and we are free to trust him from what he does in our lives. Acknowledging God as our owner, however, is more simple a mission of truth. It is surrender. Charles Spurgeon wisely said, we want personal consecration. I have heard the word pronounced, purse and all consecration. A most excellent pronunciation, certainly. He who loves Jesus consecrates to all that he has and feels in his delight that he may weigh anything at the feet of him who laid down for us. Our natural inclination is to view our needs and what we perceive to be our needs for tomorrow. As we are the owner who bears the burdens and provisions and success upon our own shoulders, we strive with the matters of money, work, family, and health. The many health requests that we heard today, we see that, you know, how the burdens just weigh us down. How we're, you know, sometimes you get so many burdens you can't even think clearly at all. You know, a uh, pastor had preached a message a few months ago about, you know, if you're so task saturated, you know, you need to reevaluate your stuff and start making time. You know, if anybody ever asks me anything, I'm almost like I always say yes. Like if somebody says, hey, can you do this? Yes, yes, yes. But sometimes, you know, that's will cause you to have so many things like you won't have time one to witness you won't have time to study God's word so you know you need to make time make your schedule um, we are not unlike the children of Israel who through God miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt quickly began worrying about food clothing and comfort I think of me and when I had cancer you know the Lord was with me the whole time I prayed for everybody else that they would be fine with it. So I knew I was totally fine. Either way, anything happened to me, the Lord was with me the whole time. I always compare myself to the life of Joseph. So um, if we, uh, but it's how quick it is to, uh, we think of Israel and then all of a sudden they do Aaron and the golden, uh, golden calf. Um, we tend to live by sight rather than by face, especially in the area of finances. I wish to challenge you through this study to radically change your perspective on money. And as a result, the experience, the joy, the peace, and the blessings that God has intended for you 
through Quayman, his promises. The three principles that give us freedom from hold on money, God is ultimate owner of all things, number one. Number two, we belong to God. Number three, the owner carries the burden, not the manager. When I was in the Marine Corps, I was a plane captain on the helicopter. That meant that I would go out to the aircraft and I would check all the parts on the aircraft. Now we, ha we had a daily and turnaround deck. It was basically like a publication, like the Bible, and it would basically spell out everything. It would, uh, it would tell us to basically check every part. It would name every part in the aircraft. So if you were on the skids, the, and it would tell you like the main rotor blade and the, all the different parts, and it would tell you underneath every little thing, damage, cleansiness, fod, and security. And you would check everything for play and looseness and make sure it's tight. I would turn, then t I would turn on the electrical power and do a cockpit check and then make sure all the parts were working electrically. I would get out and check all the lights. Once that was done, I would sign off a piece of paper saying the aircraft was safe for like after I inspected it for flight. Then you had a shop which was called maintenance control. They would look at all the paperwork to ensure all the inspections were done, all the paperwork inspections were done, and would ultimately sign the aircraft's aircraft safer flight. Now maintenance control was like the manager of the aircraft. The owner of the aircraft, if you've ever been in any service or anything, it'd be like the CEO. It'd be the commanding officer of the squadron. He was the real owner. Listen, if anything happened to that aircraft, if it was being towed from our hangar to the wash rack to get washed and was driven into something, the CEO was the owner. It didn't matter that that Lance Corporal ran in, wasn't looking or something like that. He was the ultimate owner. The responsibility is ulti ultimately on the CEO, the commanding officer. If the aircraft crashed in flight, a lot of times the, the commanding officer would get relieved in the Marine Corps. He was the real owner. When we consciously acknowledge God's ownership and, we, and with all our hearts give him all the precious things in our lives, our burden is lifted. We are his managers called to be the faithful stewards and gladly bear the burdens for us. Since God owns our lives, he also owns our trials, our concerns, and our problems. The great news, we get to, we get to give it all to Jesus. That's how it works. 1 Peter 5 says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. We, When we are free from our burdens, having cast down upon the Lord, we are free to serve him. Who here has uh, gone grocery shopping? You get home, you pull up into the car, uh, driveway or on the street, whatever you do, and you try to see if you can get all the groceries in one trip. <laughs> we do this because we're trying to be more efficient. No, we do this because we don't want to make two trips. You use every finger you have, your arms and your fingers feel the weight of all the bags that you're hanging. You're kind of going in there like, uh, like your arms are like totally pulled down as hard as they can be. Then you get in front of the door and hopefully it's open. Or you got to figure out how to untangle it or see if you can release one fingertip. Then then you, let, then you uh, strain to lift them up on the counter. You get in there and you try to put them on the counter because usually my wife will say, don't put them on the floor. And so I have to put them on the counter. And then you let them go and your fingers are tingling and you can feel the weight lifted off of them. That's the picture of us handing our cares and burdens, all of them, to the Lord. We feel just weighted down. We're just like, oh, I can't do anymore. Like if you somebody try to put something else on you, or if you take too much burdens, what happens when you're carrying those groceries? You're carrying them in, and you go, oh, I can carry this one more thing, and then <laughs> something falls out of your bag, and another thing falls out of your bag. You try to pick it up, more things fall out. So you can only handle so much burdens. The Lord can handle all our burdens and more. So um, the weight is left off. That's the picture of us handing all the burdens to him. Your muscles were so sore, you were getting weary, but now all the weight is suddenly gone. Your strength is back, your vision is clear, and now your arms and hands are free from relief. I think of last weekend, I've been going and going and going for so many months, and I've been trying to wrap up all my stuff. So I had six projects I wanted to get completely. I'm good at getting 80% done, and I still have like 20% left of that project, and then I 
go on and I start doing some other. So I finished up all, uh, almost all my projects except two. But this weekend was like the first weekend that I could actually not think about I have to do this, I have to do this, and all this, you know. So it's, I was able to think a lot clearer this weekend because I didn't have anything else to worry about. Do you see the benefits of bracing the truth that God had, the truth that God in you, uh, benefits of bracing the truth that God for you? Uh, the purpose is to be glorified through us. You see beyond your victories also. As God works in your life, bearing the burdens, providing for you, and answering the prayers, he doesn't want you to keep it a secret. He desires your praise and that you would give him the glory and tell others the great things he has done. Jesus told his disciples, and whatsoever shall he ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We should be telling others what God has done for us in our lives and give him the glory. If you're getting all your prayers answered and everything else and you're not telling people, you're not telling people about what Jesus has done in your life, shame on you. You know, we, we pray and we ask for these miracles and then when he gives us these miracles, we just hold them where I go. You know, you should, we should also, I mean, I heard uh, several months ago, uh, a family started just saying every day we're going to do praises. And at first it was just like, yeah, praise the Lord for just the air, you know, was the simple ones. But as you continually do that, you know, you'll start thinking deeper and you'll be like, you know, your praise will come a lot easier because you're actually evaluating your life for praises rather than just your prayers, what I need, what I need, what I need, you know. So the truth of ownership is one of the most important liberating truths of the scripture. That frees us from the burden of being our own provider, and it frees us from the approach of our finances with the internal perspective of managing God's money for him. But how do we do it? Well, that's the subject for the next chapter. Tim Miller will be teaching that next week. The principles of stewardship. All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for the day. I thank you, Lord, for just uh, the many people here, Lord. Just bless them and be with them, Lord. Think of those many prayer requests, Lord, of just uh, the burdens on us, Lord. I think of just the groceries, just carrying that, Lord, and just how heavy that gets, Lord. And we just uh, know that you can just take all of those, Lord. And we just... Uh, Lay all those burdens at your feet today, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, and love you. We ask all these in Jesus' name. Amen.